Hello, I'm uh, Professor Patrick Holberg from Kalamazoo College. In this video, I would like to go through uh, several slides to talk about who are the winners and who are the losers from international trade. Uh, my approach will be that I will first uh, discuss the model setup, and then I will give you the no trade outcome, which will be our benchmark. And then I'm going to introduce trade in three different situations. One, uh, when we have perfect factor immobility. And then for the second case, we have uh, partial factor mobility. And in the last one, we have perfect factor mobility. Uh, these three cases will show that international trade is good for the country. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the income distributional effects from international trade. That is, uh, you know, who are the winners and who are the losers. And then lastly, I will just put all of these things into a diagram so we can go beyond the math and look at the diagram as well. So thank you very much. See you on the next slide. The model we will be discussing in this video is a basic one factor uh, model where we have two countries, Denmark and Norway for my examples, two goods, food and beverages, and one factor, as I said before, so we're only considering labor. And then uh, whenever you're going to solve this problem, you have to first set, uh, you know, what are your resources and what is your technology and what are your preferences. So again, to make uh, my discussion a bit more concrete, I'm going to give each country 300 units of labor. The technology will be given by these unit labor requirements. A unit labor requirement shows, for example, here that it takes three units of labor to produce one unit of good F in Denmark. So that's what a unit labor requirement uh, describes. So we see here that uh, in Denmark, it takes more workers to produce an F than in Norway, whereas in Denmark and Norway, they take the same amount of workers to produce one unit of B. The pre preferences we have here is just going to be a standard Cobb-Douglas, so uh, F to the power of 0.5, B to the power of 0.5. Once we have these uh, assumptions for our model, we can look at some of the implications. Uh, so the first thing is we want to determine you know, which good does each country have a comparative advantage in? So the first thing we have to do is calculate the opportunity cost. The opportunity cost is just the ratio of the unit labor requirement. So for Denmark here, the opportunity cost of F is equal to the ratio of the unit labor requirement for the F good divided by unit labor requirement of the B good. So that will be just 3 divided by 1 equals 3B. So it takes, you know, to produce one F good in Denmark, the country would have to give up the production of three uh, beverages, B goods. Uh, the opportunity cost of the other good is just the inverse, the reciprocal. So the opportunity cost of B is equal to one third F in Denmark. Uh, for Norway, this one is pretty straightforward. The opportunity cost of an F good is one B good. And the opportunity cost of a B good is of course one F good. Looking at these, we can uh, quickly see that uh, the opportunity cost of producing the B good in Denmark, one third, is less than opportunity cost of producing a B good in Norway, one. So Denmark will have a comparative advantage in the B good, and Norway will have a comparative advantage in the F good, since you know opportunity cost of producing an F, one B, is less than three B, which is the opportunity cost of producing an F in. Denmark. All right, so now that we have the setup, we can go ahead and try to solve this model. Okay, so we have our model. The next step is to figure out what Denmark uh, would produce and consume if there was no trade. The first thing we have to remember is that when there is no trade, then whatever a country consumes the country itself would have to produce it. So what we're going to just do here is solve the constrained maximization problem here, where we're trying to maximize the utility of the Danish consumer, uh, given the, the limited resources 
and the technology available to Denmark. So, uh, so uh, again, this is kind of like a budget constraint or a or a, or a uh, you know a resource constraint. So the resource constraint for Denmark is three F plus one B equals three hundred. That is, uh, for every F good, it takes three workers. So three times F is the number of workers producing F good. One B is the number of workers producing the B goods. And of course, if you add those two things up together, it cannot be greater than the number of total. Uh, workers in the country. I'm going to just use the substitution method when I solve this uh, uh, optimization problem. So I'm bringing it from a constrained uh, maximization problem to an unconstrained uh, problem instead. So you can see here that B equals 300 minus 3F. Over here to the right, I have uh, just written the standard uh, results for the Cub Douglas when you have a constrained optimization problem. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and solve it, uh, the, you know, going through the steps here, but we could just look at this one and we would know what the answer would be. For example, it looks like F would be equal to alpha, which is 0 0.5 times 300 divided by 1. So F should be equal to 150. Uh, sorry, F is 3, so 150 divided by 3, so it would be equal to 50. And B will be equal to 1, you know, 0.5 times 300 divided by 1. So that will be equal to 150. But let's see if, if that's actually the case when I go ahead and solve my problem over here. So uh, obviously the first thing we would do is just take the derivative of the utility function with respect to the F good. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this somewhat carefully in this slide here. So uh, you can see here you take the derivative with respect to F. So the first term... take the exponent down and you subtract 1 from the exponent and then you multiply by the second term and then we take the derivative of the second term and multiply it by the first term so the second derivative or the, the derivative of the second term is 0.5 times 300 minus 3f again subtracting 1 from the exponent gives us minus 0.5 uh, then we have to take the derivative of the inside, which is minus 3, and then we multiply it by the first term, and we set that all equal to 0. All right, so this one looks somewhat complicated, but we're going to move the second term here over to the other side of the equality sign, and you can see then that several things will just simplify away. So let me just go through these steps. Now we have minus 3, but when I move it over to the other side, it becomes positive 3. Uh, so I'm going to move this, I'm going to move this one to the other side. So I'm going to divide both sides by 300 minus 3f to the power negative 0.5. And I'm going to move my f to the power negative 5 over to the other side. You can see that the 0.5s will just uh, cancel out. So what I have then at the end of the day is 300 minus 3f equals 3f. Move the f's to one side. 6f equals 300. f equals 50. That's what we had uh, predicted from when we looked over here as well. So that's good. Let's just check out our B uh, answer. B is equal to 300 minus 3 times F, which is now 50. So that's equal to 300 minus 150. It's 150. So uh, we could have just used a shortcut, but here we are. We have a good answer for uh, what uh, the optimal bundle of F and B is in Denmark when they cannot trade. So uh, again, we have to be careful here. So these are what they would like to consume. But clearly, since they're not trading, this will also be equal to what they produce. So these, these, re oops, sorry. So these results over here, 
is both the production point or the production bundle, which is equal to the consumption bundle. And in fact, one major benefit from international trade is that you can separate what you produce from what you consume. And it is that separation that allows you to reach uh, consumption bundles that would not be possible given your own technology. So by taking advantage of uh, the fact that countries are different from each other and the fact that trade is like having access to a new technology because of those differences, we can see that we will be better off. But uh, before I go ahead and start uh, talking about trade and the benefits of trade, let's just calculate the total utility for, uh, for the, the autarky or the no trade benchmark. So the utility is the number of F goods. So F goods is 50 to the power of 0.5 and we have 150 B goods to the power of 0.5. If you just calculate that and I have done that, it turns out to be 86.60. So this is the benchmark. Clearly Denmark should not trade with any other country if they cannot reach a utility level that is higher than 86.6. .6. So that's what we're gonna be exploring now. Can they in fact reach a utility level that is higher than their uh, autarky utility level? We go into the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to look at uh, the impact of international trade. So the first case we're going to look at is when we have perfect factor immobility. This would be uh, what I would call the extreme short run. So this means that no worker can move from the industry in which she works to another industry as a result of trade. So everybody is just stuck producing what they are producing right now. And therefore, and this will make sense to you, uh, the production in this country will stay the same. Nobody can move. Technology stays the same. And therefore, everybody will be producing exactly the same thing. So you remember from the last slide that uh, they're producing 150 units of B and 50 units of F. And the question is, even though we don't change any uh, production levels, so they, they stay exactly the same, can this country still become better off? by trading according to some terms of trade. So uh, clearly we need to figure out what the terms of trade is. Uh, the terms of trade uh, will always be in between the two countries' opportunity costs. So uh, because if it was less, then one country would not have an incentive to trade at all. So uh, you can see here that uh, the opportunity cost of a B good in Denmark is one third, the opportunity cost of a B good in Norway is one. So, uh, we have to pick a terms of trade that is in between and the obvious uh, suggestion might be one half. So the terms of trade in terms of B goods is that if you trade one B good, you will get half a F in return. Or if you were trading uh, an F good, you will get two B for every F that you might be trading. So these are our terms of trade here, and now we're going to try to figure out what will the consumption uh, be. Well, uh, we have to just be a little bit careful here. So uh, if I go back here, so, you know, the consumption of B goods, you know, you have 150 B goods. Uh, in the first slide, we know that Denmark has a comparative advantage, comparative advantage in B, so they're going to be exporting some of the B goods. So whatever number of goods that you export, let's call that X, uh, you will not be able to consume. So the consumption of B, if Denmark chooses to export some, will be less than 150. But in return, the production of uh, the F good will be enhanced by the imports of F that Denmark gets in return from the exports of B. But here's the thing is, for every unit of B that they export, they only get half an F. So we have to take that terms of trade into account. 
But if we do this one, then uh, we can try to determine what's the optimal amount of exports for Denmark. And that will just be to solve our uh, constrained maximization or unconstrained maximization problem right now, actually. So you put in what the F, the number of F goods over here and the number of B goods over here. And then you just go ahead and take the derivative with respect to uh, X, that is the number of exports. Uh, this is going to look very similar to what we did before. Uh, so I'm going to go slightly faster here. I'll just write the first one, so it'll be 0.5. 50 plus x divided by 2 to the power of minus 0.5 times the inside, which is 1 half, plus, oops, sorry, and then multiply by the second term to the power of 0.5, and then we take this derivative of the second term, 0.5, 150 minus x, minus 0.5 times the inside, minus 1, times 50 plus x divided by 2 to the power of 0.5. And all that's going to be equal to 0. If I just uh, simplify this one, I'm going to just get something that looks like this. So, I'll let you check that out a little bit later. So, we have 100 plus x equals 150 minus x or moving the x over to one side 2x equals 50 moving the 100 over to the other side x equals 25. all right so this is the number of uh, units that denmark should be exporting in order to maximize its utility given the terms of trade that we picked uh, clearly, then, our we can calculate what they will be consuming in terms of F goods and B goods. So for F, it's, they had they produced 50 themselves, and then they exported 25, and they're getting 25 divided by 2 uh, units of uh, F in return for a total consumption of F equals 62.5. And for B, they produce 150, but then they export 25 of those, and therefore they have only 125 uh, still to consume by themselves. If we take these numbers and we plug it into our utility function, we can see if this is in fact better in terms of utility than uh, what it was under no trade. And uh, I have calculated this one, and it turns out to be 88.39. So, the country is in fact better off from trade, even though nobody could uh, move. That is, there is no specialization in production, but just from the fact that they can consume a bundle that is more favorable, given their utility function, they can actually make themselves better off. This is an interesting uh, result because usually you think that the benefits of trade comes from our ability to reallocate our resources into the production of the, uh, the good that we have a competitive advantage in. Here, we, do, do not re we, know, we don't change our resources in any way and still trade is good for us. All right, so uh, now I'm going to relax that a little bit. I'm going to let some workers move. So first we're going to do that uh, let a few workers move, and then we're going to let everybody move to the, uh, the industry in which they have a competitive advantage. All right, so here we're going to look at partial factor mobility. So, uh, you know, usually we would not do this one, but I thought it might be good to just to see, uh, you know, how these things really work. So if we go over here to the right, we can see that, you know, before trade, they're producing 150 units of B and 50 units of F like we've seen several times. Uh, here, I'm just showing you how many workers does it take to produce 150 units of B? Well, since it takes one worker to produce one B, it will take 150 workers to produce 150 B. And to produce 50 units of labor, it takes three workers to produce one unit of F. 
So to produce 50 units of F, it takes three workers to produce one unit of F, and therefore it will take 150 workers to produce 50 units of F. So in terms of partial movement of workers, I'm going to assume as an example, suppose 50 workers move from F production into B production. So that's sort of like a partial specialization. Clearly then that we'll have, we will then have a 200 workers in the B industry. 200 workers in the B industry will be able to produce 200 divided by unit labor requirement. 200 divided by one equals 200 Bs. And in the, you know, the number of workers left in the F industry is 150 minus 50. So there's 100 workers, and those workers can produce 100 divided by the unit labor requirement. 100 divided by 3 equals 33.33 uh, units of F. All right, so this is going to be our production points now when we have partial uh, factor mobility. So I'm just going to go ahead and write that up here. So we're going to be producing 200 units of B and 33.3 units of F. Of course, uh, that's what we produce. International trade allows us to consume a different uh, bundle of goods. So we can see if we can uh, make our utility higher by trading some of those Bs for Fs. So again, the consumption point will, of course, be 200 minus the number of B goods that we export. And we keep the, the terms of trade the same. So every, X, uh, every unit of B that we export, we will get one half F in return. So that's the number of F goods that we'll be able to consume. Putting that into our utility function. We can then go ahead and uh, maximize this with respect to exports. And, uh, and by now, you know, you're going to be familiar with this one. So if I just took the derivative of utility function with respect to x and set it equals zero, uh, just going through some steps that we have done before, we will get something that looks very similar. So we have 66.67 plus x equals 200 minus x. 2x equals 133.33. And therefore, x equals 66.67. We can then see that this will allow us to consume... 33.3 uh, plus 66.67 divided by 2, that is 66.67 units of F. And in terms of B goods, we'll have 200 that we produce ourselves. We export 66.67 of them, and therefore we are left with 133.33. As usual, we want to see if this makes us uh, better off. So we take these numbers and we plug them into our utility function. This is number of B good, I mean F goods, and here's the number of B goods. We just go ahead and calculate that, and it turns out to be once again. Oh, sorry, it's actually ninety-four. Point twenty-eight, So we are, in fact, better. Even partial uh, mobility gives us a higher utility than uh, zero mobility, which in turn was higher than no trade at all. So we can see that it looks like the more mobility we have, the better off we will be in terms of uh, national welfare. So we'll go ahead and uh, look at the, uh, the extreme case where we have perfect factor mobility in the next slide. Okay, so here's the, the case where we can have complete specialization, specialization according to compare advantage. So this will be where we have perfect factor mobility. So workers will move out of the industry that has comparative disadvantage, which for Denmark is F, and move into the industry with comparative advantage. 
which for Denmark is B. So if you look over here to the right, we can see that uh, we have complete specialization. And therefore, they will only produce uh, uh, B goods. So all workers, LB in Denmark, will be in the B industry. So 300 workers there. Well, which of course means that there are zero workers in the F industry and therefore we'll have 300 units of B produced, 300 divided by unit labor, unit labor requirement, and of course we'll have zero units of F produced. So here we can uh, write, we have 300 B in, as our production point and zero F. But, and again, so this will be very similar to you. We don't have to consume what we produce because we international trade. Our production point and our consumption points are separated from each other. And therefore, we will consume 300 miners, whatever we export. And we will get in return this many units of uh, F goods as imports. I'll put that into... I know that the zero is obviously we don't need that one, but I just do it to be very clear here. Put it into our utility function, take the derivative, and this is what we get: two times x squared equals three hundred minus x. X equals three hundred minus x. Two x equals three hundred. X equals one hundred and fifty. And therefore, we will be consuming x divided by 2, which is 75 units of F good, and 300 minus uh, 75, no, sorry, 300 minus 150 units of B, so we'll consume 150 units of B. So this is our consumption point. We'll want to see if that makes us better off. So we put our consumption point into our utility function. We go ahead and calculate that. And it turns out to be 106.07. Clearly, international trade with perfect factor mobility is the outcome that makes Denmark as a country uh, reach the highest level of utility. So this will be the, the, the outcome that makes the country in terms of national welfare as well off as it possibly can be. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if we only care about national welfare, this will be the end and therefore we would have to conclude that three, uh, you know, free trade is good. Uh, however, we will... Uh, see very shortly that there might be some uh, income distributional effects from trade uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about next. Okay, in order to explore the income distributional effects from international trade, we're going to be looking at the real wage of the workers in the two industries. So the first thing I want to point out here that we are assuming perfect competition here, which means that all markets including the labor market is perfectly competitive and therefore the nominal wage will be equal to the the marginal revenue product uh, that is the price of the good that the worker is producing times the marginal productivity of that worker but uh, this is probably something that you have noticed that the marginal product of labor is of course the number of B goods that one worker is producing at the margin, but that is equal to one divided by unit labor requirement. For example, if the unit labor requirement is three, then one worker, that is it takes three workers to produce one unit of B good, that's not true in my example, but let's just go with that, then one worker would be producing one third B. So that would be the marginal productivity of that worker. Uh, we don't care about nominal wage, we always care about the real wage. So if I just divide the nominal wage by the, the price, we get that the real wage is equal to 1 divided by the unit labor requirements. So this is the, the trick that we'll be, we will be using when we calculate real wage of the workers. Alright, so here we are, worker, a worker in the B industry. 
Obviously, a worker in a bee industry is producing bee goods. And uh, the worker, because there's only one resource here, the workers will be paid exactly what she produces. So therefore, you can see here that the real wage of the worker will be 1 divided by the unit labor requirement, 1 divided by 1. So the worker will be paid 1B. Now here's the interesting thing. That worker can either consume the B good or she can try to trade the B good for F goods. Uh, but before trade, the only person she can trade with is an F worker in her own country. And therefore, the terms of trade, so to speak, would be the opportunity cost in the B good. I mean, the in opportunity cost of the B good in the country in which she works. So, uh, to calculate the number of F goods that a B worker can consume, you take the number of B goods that she is producing. We know that's equal to 1B, right? So, she's producing 1B, and then she will trade that for F goods. And... Uh, The opportunity cost in uh, in Denmark before trade would be one third F per B, and therefore the B worker, if she chooses to trade for F goods, would get to consume one third F. All right, so this is a little bit confusing. Hopefully, you know. So she has either one B, that's is what she produces herself. Or if she trades for F goods with domestic uh, F workers, she can consume one third F. Just to you know, make this clear, let's look at an F worker in Denmark. An F worker would be producing one divided by the unit labor requirements in the F good, so one divided by three. So the F worker will be producing one third F. But the worker can try to uh, trade that for uh, B goods at the, the relative price or the opportunity cost in the domestic country. And therefore, that worker would, oops, sorry. The worker would produce one third F, and then they can tr trade that for three B for every F, and therefore, they can consume one B if they choose to trade. So now this worker can either consume one third F or they can trade and consume one B. And of, of course, the first thing you notice is that all workers can consume exactly the same thing before trade. They're all exactly the same. Going back and forth, all workers are exactly the same. Now, this is not going to be the case when we have pa perfect factor immobility. So now I'm going to be looking at the case when we have trade, but workers are not able to move. When that happens, then uh, the workers will be facing not their domestic opportunity cost, but instead they will be facing the terms of trade. So for a B worker, you know, they will be... Uh, producing uh, 1 divided by the unit labor requirement, so they will be producing this many B goods, but then they will trade that at the terms of trade, and remember the terms of trade is 1 half F per B, and therefore if they choose to not consume the B that they produced and instead trade for the F goods, they will get 1 half F. So uh, this is obviously uh, really interesting because now you can see that this uh, worker who's working in the B industry, the export industry, is actually better off because one half F is higher than one third F. So they are actually better off from trade. Let's see if that's the case for the F worker. An F worker will be producing one third F and then they can trade that F for B goods at the terms of trade. So the terms of trade is now 2B for every F. 
and therefore they can trade and get two thirds B if they trade with the you know workers in the other country. But here we see a problem, which is that two thirds B is less than one B. So the worker in the F industry, the import competing industry, is actually worse off. So uh, we would have to conclude that when you have perfect factor immobility, that is the workers uh, are not able to move from one industry to the next. In particular, they cannot move out of the import competing industry and into the exporting industry. Then workers who are in the export industry will be winners, but the workers who are stuck in the import competing industry will be losers. That is, uh, international trade with perfect factor immobility creates both winners and losers within the country, even though the country as a whole is better off. All right, let's just uh, look at the last case, and this is going to be very straightforward. If you have perfect factor mobility, that means that you know all these workers in the F industry who are being hurt by international trade, they will just decide to move into the B industry instead. And therefore, the... The return, the real wage of all workers in the B industry is still either 1B if they don't trade or 1 half F if they do trade. That is, this is the same as we had, uh, you know, with uh, for a B worker when we have perfect factor immobility. The only difference now is that all workers are B workers, and therefore all workers are winners. That is, everybody benefit from international trade. So if you have one factor, perfect factor mobility, then Trade is good for the country, and trade is good for everyone in the country because everybody will be working in the export industry after complete specialization. There are no losers in the long run if we define long run with perfect factor mobility. This is an important uh, conclusion, of course, uh, but of course, we also have to remember that the long run is, a, you know, as Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. So we also have to remember that in the short run, where we have some factor immobility, there will be some losers after international trade, as well as many, many winners, of course. All right. That's the main conclusion. I just want to show some of these things in a diagram on the next page. Okay, so we have gone through uh, several steps in this model. First, we looked at uh, the case of no trade. And then we looked at, uh, uh, you know, the case with trade, but perfect factor immobility. Then we allowed for some factor mobility. And then finally, we allowed for complete or perfect factor mobility. And every time we did that, our utility increased uh, you know, as we became more and more able to move from one industry to the next. And in this diagram, I'm just going to show these things. So what we have here, uh, clearly this, you know, in the first case, we were producing 50 F goods and 150 B goods. And this will be the no trade. And therefore, what you produce is also what you consume. And our utility function would have been tangent at that point. And uh, I'm going to go back and look what the uh, indifference curves, you know, the first indifference curve we had. So this will be no trade. And you remember that the level of 
utility was 86.60. And then in the next case, we have allowed for trade, but uh, there is perfect factor immobility. So the first thing I want to you know notice that all these green lines here, these are the trade lines. And the slope of that line is the terms of trade. So one half F per B. You notice that is, is steeper than the PPF we had for this country because the production possibilities frontier, the slope of that one, which is the opportunity cost, was equal to one half, now one third, 100 divided by 300, one third F per B. So the terms of trade line is steeper and after trade, even if we cannot move any workers, you notice that we were able to reach an indifference curve that was slightly higher. So this is uh, the first case. And our utility in that case was 88.39, slightly better. And then finally, we allowed for some partial uh, mobility. And if that's if we uh, we moved 50 workers to from the F industry into the B industry, then we can produce. We we're here. We can produce 200 units of B, and it was 33.3 .3 units of F. That production point, if we trade some B goods for F goods along the along the trade line, we can reach a utility function that is higher up than from before. This will be our second one. Uh, if I look back, I will remember that that level utility at that point was 94.28. And then finally, allowing for complete specialization. They only produce B goods, so they produce 300 units of B and zero F. But then they can trade Bs for Fs along the trade line up here. And that allowed us to reach this consumption bundle up here, which we're at the highest indifference curve. And at that point, the level of utility was equal to 106.07. So here we see that as we allow for a trade, utility increases as factor mobility increases. Again, we just want to remember that until we get to the case of perfect factor mobility, complete specialization, there are winners and losers. In, in particular, the winners are the ones in the X industry, the export industry, which in this case was the B industry, and the losers are the ones in the import competing industry, which in my example was the F industry here in Denmark. All right, that's a lot of material, but this really shows uh, almost a complete uh, overview of the one-factor model that we have been discussing. Thank you very much.